I'd like to welcome everyone to our online study of the book of Revelation. I'm glad that you are joining us this evening. And after tonight, we're going to be halfway through the book. We'll be uh, finished with chapter 11. And there's 22 books in Revelation. So we are making good progress. We're going through very quickly. And always feel free to reach out to me at Jessica T at lakepoint.org if you ever have any questions as we go. Because I know that we are going through at a pretty rapid pace for um, a very challenging book, but hopefully you're seeing as we go through it, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that it is able to, you're, you can understand this book when you understand its parts. So, uh, but if you're struggling, feel free to reach out. This is a book that people have wrestled with since the first century. So, all right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we do love you, and we do praise you as the great revealer. You are the God who has made known the things that must soon take place. And Father, we trust you. You are a good and gracious God. And Father, your word testifies to your divine nature and your eternal power, that you truly do have the power to make known the future and then to watch over your word and to fulfill it just as it is written. And Father, as we study, uh, we're stretched to think beyond the here and now because we are finite beings. And so we pray for wisdom that comes from you. We pray, Father, that you will give us insight into this book, the way that you intend it to be understood. And Father, help us to widen our horizon beyond the here and now uh, to understand your kingdom plan from your perspective. Uh, Father, these two chapters are sometimes considered uh, two of the most difficult chapters in the Bible uh, to interpret. So I pray that you'll give us wisdom, that you'll help us to be attentive to your word, uh, Father, that you will um, just allow us to understand, ease this process, and help us to put all the pieces together. Search our minds and hearts. I pray where there is confusion that you will bring clarity. And, Father, that where there are questions, that you will kind of prompt us to let us know when to just let those questions simmer. And, Father, if if they need to be addressed, that you will help us to speak truth uh, into those questions that we have. And we give you thanks, Father, that you reveal yourself as a good and gracious God. And so as we go through the study of the tribulation, this terrible time of trouble, and we rest in the safe refuge that you have pro provided for us in your son. And may we never lose sight of him as we study this uh, select a period of judgment. And so, Father, we commit this time to you and ask your full blessing and favor upon it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, and hopefully everybody's in the routine now and uh, should be getting the, should be getting all of the lessons and the recordings. And so, uh, whoops, hold on. Let me see here. Okay, document recovery. I don't ever like when it says that. <laughs> Let's take a look here. All right. I think we can close this one out. Ooh. All right. Hold on just a second and let's get this opened up. No. Right. Okay. I actually just want to close this. Say that one to like the desktop. Well, that's. This is the one I want to open. Are those not your slides in the thing? Here we go. Okay. So can you see that, everyone? Can you give me a thumbs up, Grace? Okay. All right. Excellent. 
All right, so we are going through, it's an 18 week study. We will take March 22nd off for spring break. So those especially that come in the room, keep that in mind. And you can still register for the study at lakepoint.org slash online studies. And we still have people that are registering each week. So make sure if you, if you know anyone that is interested, they can access the previous recordings and lessons, but they can actually, because of the way that we review each week, can catch up just by following along with us uh, each week. If you'd like to be added to the Facebook page, you can send me an email. Also, uh, we'd love for you to join us for worship on the weekends at Lake Point Church. We have services that we stream live that you can access online at lakepointlive.tv. And we offer services Saturday at 6 p.m. and also Sundays at 9.30 and 11. I also teach two life groups on the weekends that are available online, uh, Saturday night at 7.15 and Sunday at 10.45. And you can join those studies the same way that you're joining us right now, just by going to icampuslifegroup.com. And we would love for you to join us uh, either in the room. You can come to Lake Point, the Rockwall campus at A203, or you can join us online. And we are studying the book of First Peter, which is a great study companion to the book of Revelation. So I uh, hope that you will join us. Someone sent me an email today asking how they could find out about future online studies that we offer once this study is done. And we will keep you notified through, if you've signed up for this class, then we'll be able to send you an email about future studies and also on the Facebook page as well. But, uh, but you're always welcome to join us in life group. Here's our schedule. And this week we are on lesson eight, which is Revelation 10 and 11. So you can be opening up your Bibles. This begins an interlude that is going to continue through chapter 15. And in Revelation 11 to 15, 19, we have the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We have, uh, this contains the seven bowls of Revelation 16. We, the chronology in this, it's not actually moving forward during the interlude, but there are people and events described that will carry us to the end of the tribulation. And then we also have the announcement of Christ's reign. So this is a very rich interlude that will begin with chapter 10 and will conclude with chapter 15 before we go into chapter 16, which is the Super Bowl of Judgment. That is where we have literally the bowls. And that will not be a pretty time on earth. Now, we are going through... Uh, Four different ages as we study Revelation. Does anybody remember what those ages are? First one, church, church right? Oh, I don't want to give it away. Second one is what comes after the church age and, and hopefully the rapture. And then the next age is the tribulation. tribulation age. Exactly. And after the tribulation age, Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom when we go into the Millennial age, sometimes called the kingdom age. That's right, Don. And then after the millennial age, uh, we will have a uh, new heaven and a new earth, and we will enter into the eternal age. And Janie asked a great question on Facebook about the eternal age, and we'll study more about that in chapters 20 to 21. And that kind of gives you an idea of how we're moving through this book. Church age, tribulation age, kingdom age, eternal age. Chronologically, that is what is, those are the ages that will happen consecutively. And, uh, but the most, most of Revelation is covering just the tribulation age, which is just a seven year period. So if you ever get a little bit disoriented while you're studying Revelation, wondering, okay, now are we yet? you know, into the kingdom age, or are we still before the rapture? Uh, we're hoping that the rapture takes place before the tribulation age. Uh, but while we're studying, for the most part, chapters 4 to 19 are future to us, and all those events are contained within a seven-year period, and that's called the tribulation age. At the end of the tribulation age, at the end of the bowls, Jesus returns 
after you see Jesus return, which we'll see him return in chapter 19, then we'll enter into the kingdom age, which is the millennium, where Jesus will reign for a thousand years on the earth before we enter to that, into that eternal age. Always good to have the big picture in mind when you're studying Revelation, and also to realize that we're going to spend most of our time in the tribulation age. So don't let that scare you. Don't think this is a long period of time where we're going to see this kind of judgment. We're talking about a very select uh, number of years, just seven years. And our outline for the book of Revelation follows this chronology. Uh, in chapter one, we looked at past things, at the revelation of Christ. John, being on the island of Patmos, received this revelation of Jesus. Then we moved into present things, which is the church age, chapters two and three, the things which are. And this is the outline that's provided for us in Revelation 119. So in the book is organized, uh, first chapter one and an introduction, which dealt with the past of, you know, per what happened to John in the past, moved into the present age with present things in chapters two and three. And now we're going to spend the rest of our time in the future, the prophetic things. These are different ways to think about the book of Revelation and to have this structure in your mind of how the book is organized, and that will help you not to become disoriented as we go through these individual chapters. In chapter one, uh, let's look and see what we've done in each chapter. Now that you've got this big framework in your mind of how it's organized, the outline of the book, now let's look at these chapters and how we moved through these different sections. Chapter one, we had the introduction where John introduces the book. About 95 AD is what we can uh, estimate. And he sent a message to the seven churches. Now that was after his exile on Patmos was completed. He sent this uh, book, the Revelation, to these seven churches, and that would it represent our current age as well? This is the church age. And we remember that the seven churches, uh, I like this acronym. It just helps me to remember the unique messages that were sent to these churches. Ernest, Ephesus, Suffering, Smyrna, Persevering, Pergamum, Tolerant, Thyatira, Soiled, Sardis, Praiseworthy, Philadelphia, and finally, Lukewarm, Laodicea. And so these, these are the original churches that received the letter that was written by John. Then we studied about the rapture. Why did we study about the rapture after studying these messages to the churches? Because through the rest of the book of Revelation, there's no mention of the church again. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who believe that the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation age. But we have five different views that we've considered. We have looked at the church age uh, being completed and the rapture taking place. Now, there could be a delay between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. So we could have a pre-trib rapture, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the tribulation age will start right after the rapture. There might be... Um, uh, time there before it actually starts. We don't know. And then the partial rapture view is that some people will be raptured. Some Christians will have to go through this period of judgment, depending on faithfulness. A mid-trib rapture is looking at a significant event that happens at three and a half years. If you did your lesson, you know that three and a half years is significant in Revelation. Some people say, hey, that's when the rapture took place. We'll see some evidence for why they have that, why that view exists next week week in chapter 12. And then we see the pre-wrath rapture, where some believe that uh, there will be, that we'll have to go through most of the rapture, but before things get really bad, the Super Bowl of judgments in chapter 16, that the rapture will happen then. And then uh, finally, the post-trib rapture are those who believe that it happens at the end of the age, that there's just an about turn. So keep in mind, we, we have the church age, then we studied the rapture, because that's when we're expecting the church to be taken. We don't hear the church mentioned again in the rest of the book of Revelation. So when you're studying these uh, different judgments and you're wondering, where's the church? Where's the church? <laughs> We'd all like to know that. We don't know, but we're assuming the church is present with the Lord. We're hoping the church is not present during these times of judgment, but they're not mentioned. So that's a good indication that perhaps the rapture has already taken place. But don't try to read the church into the seven-year period because 
it's simply not mentioned um, in the text. So don't let that confuse you. Uh, then we went into this prelude of praise. You'll remember that there's going to be three series of judgments. Set the bowls. Seals, trumpets, bowls. Those are the three different judgment series. And before each judgment series, we have a prelude of praise. And we first looked at that in chapters four and five. Chapter four was devoted to the one who sits on the throne, who is God the Father. And then we have Jesus entering into the picture and sharing praise with the Father in chapter five. And this is where uh, in chapter five, he comes and takes the book out of the hand of the Father. And remember that book, the Biblion, that we saw in chapter five during this prelude of praise. Then we have chapter six, and that was the first series of judgments. And in reality, in real time, this is when time began to move forward because the seal judgments are the, at the onset. After the prelude of praise, we have the seal judgments that then begin to consecutively uh, be uh, broken and to be opened. And so we saw with the seal judgments, the Cold War, we saw famine, uh, open war, famine, death, martyrdom, and physical disturbances. And then the seventh, uh, seventh, oh, these, I have pictures of the, oh, those are the seal. Oh, because it says seven, seven trumpets. The seventh seal, when they, op when that, they open the seventh seal, they found the seven trumpets. And that's what moves us forward then in time. But we don't see the opening of the seventh seal at this point because it contains the seven trumpets and those would not sound until chapter eight. We took a break then in chapter seven, we had another interlude. You have to understand these interludes. What they are is if you were at the theater and you were watching a play, then there's a time where the curtain closes and you go into an intermission. And during that intermission, you're able to talk about, hey, did you see, you know, stage right, stage left? Um, who was that? What was he doing? And this is what John is doing. He, he has these interludes to explain to us some significant people and events that are taking place during these judgments. And so don't let this confuse you when you have an interlude, because these are not describing events that move us beyond the, the seals and the trumpets, these are things that are taking place at the same time as the judgments. And so that's probably the thing that makes interpretation most confusing for some is that to not realize when you're in an interlude, the, the curtain has, cl has, has closed and we're in a time of just discussion and giving, and John is giving us background information. And so in chapter seven, we had our first interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, which contained the seven trumpets. And the scene was earth, the time was future. We had the sealing of the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. That was on earth. And then within that chapter, we were transported up to heaven for the next prelude of praise that would usher in the trumpet judgments. And uh, that's a good question. Joel has asked the four angels that are at the four corners of the earth are held back until the sealing of the 144,000. Do we see them again? Uh, we will see a myriad, we will see angels, and it's not always easy to determine uh, which angels are which. But I think we do see the four angels again who are holding back the wind, uh, but we won't see them yet. Not not the angels that we see in the text um, for this evening. And so once we have that prelude of praise, we go into chapter chapters eight and nine, which are the trumpet judgments. And we covered those two weeks ago and, or actually last week. And this moved us then be, be beyond the midpoint of the tribulation into the second half of the tribulation. And with these uh, seven trumpets, we only opened or heard six of them sound. We see again this four plus three pattern the first four trumpets targeted the cosmos, and the final three targeted humanity. And we noted the similarity between these judgments and the Egyptian plagues. 
And we saw first the hail and the fire, second the burning mountain that fell into the sea. Then we saw wormwood who fell into the rivers and springs and made the water bitter. The sun, moon, and the stars were darkened. And trumpet four, trumpet five, we now in the final three, five, six, and seven, they were targeted towards humanity. And tar, uh, trumpet five was woe one. Trumpet six was woe two. Trumpet seven will be woe three. So when you hear the woes, keep in mind that they correlate to five, six, and seven. Trumpet five, six, and seven is woe one, two, and three. And again, we see that pattern where they're broken up between the four and the three. Now we're going to move into this interlude in chapters 10 to 15. And we have this appearance of a strong angel with a little book in hand. It's not believed that this is the same angel, Joel, as the angel that was holding back the wind uh, or the angel that we uh, just saw in the previous chapter. And then we'll have the seven peals of thunder who utter their voices, but John is not allowed to record what they spoke. And then we see John eating this book that he takes out of the hand of the angel, and he's told that he must prophesy again concerning many people's nations, tongues, and kings. So that's where we are in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, after we're going to go through both of these chapters, this is the chapter that most say is... Uh, those scholars will say is one of the most difficult to interpret. And we're going to look at the temple, temple being measured, and we will see the two witnesses, and we'll try to determine, and oh, we won't try to determine, we will uh, try to guess as far, uh, because we can't, we can't know from scripture who these witnesses might be. And so this is our outline uh, for this evening. We have the Strong Angel and the Little Book in chapter 10, 1 through 11. And then we have the Temple Measurements and the Two Witnesses in chapter 11, 1 to 19. And a takeaway from these chapters that I think will be easy after we read them is to regard the prophecies of the Revealer with reverence. Regard the prophecies of the Revealer with reverence. God is the Revealer. This is what He has made known. And we are to regard these prophecies with reverence. And I, I think that partly by being here, that is what we are doing. We are studying these with as much insight as uh, we are able to. Uh, but we want to always be cautious about remaining true to what God has revealed and not trying to guess or read too much into these prophecies. And also, I hope that you're doing your lessons, and I was very thankful that Michael gave me the heads up that it wasn't posted on the Facebook page. Hopefully you did receive those, and I'd highly encourage you. I know that it seems like that the answers are coming right directly out of the text, and they are. Trust the Holy Spirit is working through that process as you spend time in his word. And if you do your questions, it will help you interact with the text in significant ways and prepare you for then the discussions that we have. And so I hope that you're uh, doing your lessons and I would encourage you to do that. If you're having any trouble receiving those, just let me know. Uh, also keep in mind our theme verse in Revelation 1-7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. And that's what this book is about. It is about the revelation of Jesus. Now, we're going to start out this evening with the strong angel and the little book in chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. And we, be, we begin with verses 1 to 4. Uh, and when, you're, when we read these, keep in mind what John has just seen. When we finished up last week, um, he had just seen the vision of the six angels sounding the six trumpets. He saw these monster locusts appear from this demonic abyss, and they were allowed and given authority to torment mankind for five months. Now, that was trumpet five. And then the angel sounded the sixth trumpet, and he saw these four angels being released from the Euphrates River so that they could kill a third of mankind. 
And then not to mention the 200 million horsemen who rode forth, and these horses were breathing out three plagues, the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone that, he, that went ahead, that uh, resulted in the death of a third of mankind. And so this is, a, this is catastrophic. And poor John, you know, he's watching this. And perhaps John, as a prophet, he's seeing these visions. I don't know. It, it, he might have lost sense of, am I seeing something in the future or is this happening? And that could be why the Lord closes the curtain is to give John a little bit of a breather. And we see that in chapter 10. He is probably terrified by what he is seeing. And the last thing that he wants to uh, see or hear is another angel blowing a trumpet. And so with the thought that he might be about to go AWOL saying, you know, enough is enough. I can't take any more. Then in verses one to four, uh, we see that uh, what he does see, and it is another angel. So in verses one to four, it says, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. And so John is seeing here another angel, and another would suggest that it is another of the same kind. And this angel is described uh, with distinctive glory from the other angels. And some scholars have suggested it could have been Jesus himself, because we see the cloud and the rainbow. Uh, but most agree that he is just probably an exceptional angel. And since Michael, the archangel, is mentioned by name in Revelation 12, 7, the next chapter. Some have just speculated that it could possibly be Michael. Uh, he is clothed with a cloud that suggests mystery. A rainbow is upon his head, and the rainbow is the sign of the Noahic covenant, reminding God and man that he is never going to destroy humanity again with a worldwide flood. The, and the angel has this little book in his hand. And our thoughts go back to Revelation 5, where Jesus came and took the book out of the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. Uh, but this book is different. Uh, that book in Revelation 5, the Greek word to use to describe it was biblion, biblion, which is the normal word for scroll. But the book here is a different, it's Biblar Idion, and this speaks of a small document uh, with writing. It's a little scroll, and perhaps this scroll contains the message that the angel cries out with this loud voice as, with, as when a lion roars, causing the seven peals of thunder to utter their voices. And John was all prepared to write down what he had just heard, but this voice from heaven stopped him. And John was forbidden to write down what the seven peals of thunder had spoken. That would remain a mystery. And then the angel raises his right hand and makes a pledge. He, he, he swears an oath by God in verses 5 to 7, where, where it says, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, and there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. So this description of the angel standing on the sea and on the land, one foot in both places, 
designates that God's authority is over all the earth, all the land, all of the sea, and everything in them. That's the significance of this angel. This angel is an ambassador of God, and he raises his right hand, and he swears an oath. And the Greek verb there is omnuo, meaning to affirm the veracity of one statement by invoking a trans transcendent entity, frequently implied invitation of punishment if one is untruthful, swear, or to take an oath. And so this angel is, is taking an oath. He is swearing by God Almighty. And what he is swearing, he, he says he is swearing it by, he says, God himself who created the heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, which gives you another indication of why we see this angel with a, you know, with standing on both the land and the sea. And so what does he swear? Verses six and seven say that there will be delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he is about to sound then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants the prophets so this strong angel is announcing the magnitude of the judgment of that seventh angel when he sounds his trumpet with the sounding of the seventh trumpet will come judgment that is going to take us to the end of the tribulation period and this is the judgment that was spoken through prophets like Joel and like Daniel. And so there will be an end to this mystery because what the prophets of old prophesied about this day of the Lord will be brought to completion with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Because what is contained in the seventh trumpet? Seventh trumpet is the third woe, and inside that is the... Seven bowls, exactly. So we've got we've got seals, trumpets, and bowls. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, we've got seven bowls. And that brings us to the end of the tribulation. That those bowls, think of the Super Bowl. They all happen rapidly. And it's we'll see that in chapter 16. So this angel is announcing the seventh trumpet, which is the seven bowls. And so at this point, the mystery of God will be completely unveiled. And mystery in scripture, it's mysterion, it is something that cannot be known until God makes it known. And so God is about to make the end of the age known, and it will be a catastrophic judgment, such as never has or ever will again happen on earth. And it will lead to the return of Jesus, he will come in power and great glory to become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will establish his kingdom on earth. And that kingdom will be the millennial kingdom, which will last for a thousand years. And so that's the, that's the age that we're approaching. And that's what this angel was announcing. Now, if I were John at this point, having just witnessed what he had witnessed, and he might be thinking, am I done? You know, the mystery is complete. Am I finished? Um, and retirement was probably sounding pretty good to him. I mean, he was on, an, he was on Patmos on an isle, island, so he couldn't have walked away if he'd wanted to. And I don't think he could have, even if he'd wanted to. But it must have been so terrifying to, um, to see what he was seeing. But this voice from heaven addresses John. And I think that's what chapter 10 is all about. This is a little breather for John because John is seeing something that is so terrifying um, and he's having to record that. And that's what we're reading. What we're reading about, he actually saw. And that's how he recorded it. Um, and so this voice in heaven stops him and lets him know that he is not finished yet. And we see that in verses 8 to 11. It says, Then the voice which I had heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. 
and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So this incident of John eating this book is indicative of his prophetic ministry. We see similar incidences with Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where in Jeremiah 15, 16, Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I've been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. And then Ezekiel in Ezekiel 3, 1, uh, this is, uh, says, God said to him, son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, son of man, feed your stomach and feed your body with the scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And so it's very indicative of this prophetic ministry that is shared by John and Ezekiel and also Daniel. So John eats this little book and it tastes sweet as honey, just as it had to Ezekiel, but it made his stomach bitter. And we're reminded of John's circumstances. He was living in forced exile on this island of Patmos. He separated from his loved ones, from his family, his friends. His physical circumstances were brutal. And beyond the physical, he's experiencing through these visions this great period of tribulation. And so God's words tasted like honey to his mouth. But these words were prophesying of a time of judgment that made his stomach bitter. And he was watching the world scene as God unleashes his fury and his wrath against all the rebellion and unbelief of the world. So we're reminded of the difficulty of John's prophetic call as he is watching these visions and God just closes the curtain and he encourages his servant. Uh, but in verse 11, it does indicate that John's not finished, that he must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And this is exactly what we will see in the remaining chapters. The day of the Lord is God's judgment of many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. This day of reckoning has finally arrived for those who have rebelled against God, who have rejected God's son, who have oppressed God's people, and now they will meet their maker's fury and wrath. And that is what this period is all about. And so just a summary of chapter 10, we see that after John takes the little book from the hand of the strong angel and eats it, he is told that he must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So that's just a brief summary of what we saw in chapter 10. And what is a truth that we learn about God from this chapter that is true for all people of all times? Uh, this is a, a timeless principle. What we see is that God's word is as sweet as honey in the mouths of his people. But his word also announces the bitter judgment of many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. From the perspective of believers, God's word is sweet as honey. And that is consistent um, throughout the Bible that we are to not fear his word. We are to eat his word. We are to be nourished by his word. Also realizing, though, that there are times in his word where he is announcing this bitter judgment and uh, we are to revere those prophecies as well. Any questions about this section? Let's look in chat. I might have gotten behind. Let's see. All right. So Evelyn says, Revelation 10.1, strong angel, angel of the Lord Christ himself. Revelation 10.1, feet, pillars of fire. Um, he's consuming fire, face was as the sun, Christ is the light. There are definitely some divine characteristics 
uh, that are ascribed to this angel, but that's not unusual uh, for the angels. And I noticed that too in verse three, where it says, voice as when a lion roars, uh, and Jesus is the lion of Judah. So there are scholars that have taken a look at this and thought that perhaps this is Jesus himself. But the consensus has been that it's that it isn't because this wouldn't we'll see as we go into the next few chapters that the angels play a big role during the tribulation period. These are glorious, glorious beings that are coming from the presence of God. And so they can uh, share some of the divine glory, even though they're not God, uh, but they are God's ambassadors. And so. I don't know that this would be uh, Jesus. We will see Jesus come in Revelation 19, but we don't see him yet. And that's what's key is when he comes, you will know it. Um, before then, it will be unlikely that we will uh, have him playing. A, it, I just don't think that it fits uh, what we see in the rest of Revelation to see Jesus make this appearance at this time. So, but you're right, Evelyn, there are indications in there that would kind of point us to that uh, conclusion. So that's a good thought. And we might find out it is Jesus. I mean, it could be. Uh, I kind of tended, at first, that was my first thought, and then I went to, I, I thought it was probably an angel. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. Just because when we see the role that the angels play throughout the rest of the book. Any other questions or observations? Okay. I thought this was Joel's question that we already Yeah, I think we, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. All right. Well, as we conclude this chapter, um, any questions, any other thoughts? I don't want to rush you. Okay. Think about as we think about this particular chapter and how it applies to us today. How does God's word taste in your mouth? Do you find it sweet as honey? And as you read these prophecies, do you scoff? There are scoffers in the world that say, oh, these things, you know, they're never going to take place. They've been saying this since the first century and these things have never happened. Um, and that kind of scoffing is what we see in the people who are experiencing the tribulation. And we don't want to, to be like that. We want to regard these prophecies reverently uh, with faith and belief and study them with integrity. Uh, and then I thought about John and the difficulty of his task that God had called him to. And I wondered to what difficult task has God called you to serve? And will you endure through the difficulties until God says that the work is done? And I might be reading into John's uh, difficulties, but when you place yourself in his position, uh, that had to be a very difficult call. And think about your own circumstances. And sometimes God calls us to go through difficult seasons or to serve in difficult ways. And we simply have to trust him and endure until he says that the work is done. He's the one that gets to make that call. All right, so let's move on into uh, chapter 11. We look at verses 1 to 19 with the temple measurements and also the two witnesses. And that's where we begin. And this is a difficult chapter, so uh, this we're going to do some, we're going to try to make it easy just by doing a little background uh, study around what's happening here. But we start out with verses uh, one and two, where uh, God calls John to measure the temple. He says, there was given me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now, the temple would have been familiar to John's readers. It was a central place of worship for the Jewish people, for the nation of Israel. It was the only place that they could make their sacrifices at the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. 
And so here is a visible model of the uh, of the of Jerusalem in the first century. And I know that uh, your mom, just Gail, just got back from Israel, so she probably got to see this model. If you ever go to Israel, it is a uh, it is a amazing model. So when you're looking at this, this looks like a real building, and this is actually a model and uh, takes up about a block. You know where they have uh, just built um, what. Jerusalem would have looked like in 66 AD. And so it kind of gives you an idea of what the temple would have looked like in the surrounding court. And so John is told to measure uh, the temple. Now, the first temple in Jerusalem was built by Solomon, who was the son of David. He was the third king of the nation of Israel. And he built the first temple in Jerusalem in 966 B.C. This is B.C., before Jesus. Uh, Solomon reigned as king from 971 to 931 B.C. That temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And that happened as the nation of Judah was being carried off into a 70-year timeout, exile, in the nation of Babylon. Now, they were allowed to return in 539 B.C. with the decree of Cyrus. And when they came back, um, then the temple was rebuilt. But this temple uh, is reflecting what it looked like in A.D. 66, uh, when it, Jerusalem was at its peak and before its destruction in A.D. 70. That would happen later. Uh, the phrase temple of God would refer to the inner chambers. John was told to measure the temple of God. And this is referring to the inner chambers of the temple itself. The most innermost room is called the Holy of Holies. And this is the room where the presence of God was manifested in the midst of Israel. This is where the Ark of the Covenant uh, was uh, kept. Uh, that contained the stone tablets where Moses wrote out the Ten Commandments, it contained the blossomed staff of Aaron, and also a jar of manna. And all of these were reminders of Israel's exodus out of Egypt and also their wanderings in the wilderness. They would carry the Ark of the Covenant wherever they went, even if they went into battle. It was the symbol of God's presence in their midst. And in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant would be kept in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, the outer chain, right outside of the Holy of Holies, was the holy place. Now, the priest could enter more than just the high priest. The other priest could enter into the holy place. And this is where the altar of incense uh, stood before the entrance to the Holy of Holies. We studied about the uh, altar of incense last week. Now, in this picture, you can see the outer court of the Gentiles. Court of the Gentiles is that outer court. And John was told in verses 1 through 2 to measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship in it leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now, uh, nations, when it, you see it translated, mine says nations, the same word is Gentiles. Gentiles and nations, it's the same Greek word. So you can see the court of the Gentiles. And John was not to measure this area, only the inner chambers of the temple, the holy place, and the holy of holies, and possibly the altar, and it could have been the brazen altar, that stood just in front of the entry um, to the temple. And the question that people often ask in chapter 11 that makes it difficult is what temple is John measuring? Which, which temple is it that, that John is supposed to, to measure? And so uh, this is a, a timeline of the different temples that have that are part of Israel's history. Uh, you can go back to the beginning with the tabernacle. See that in the very first picture. The tabernacle was that mobile sanctuary that Israel carried with them 
uh, through the wilderness between 1446 and 1406 BC. It finally came to rest when Israel came into the land of Canaan, but they, it rested at Shiloh, which was the first place of central worship of Israel in Canaan. Now, once David made Jerusalem the capital of Israel, then the, the capital was moved, and his son, Solomon, built the first temple, um, not the tabernacle, but the first temple in Jerusalem. He did that in 966 B.C. Like I said, it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in uh, 586 B.C. when Judah was taken into exile. Uh, now, the second temple, and you often hear people say the t second temple period. The second temple refers to the post-exilic temple. This is after Judah returned from that 70 years of exile, and Zerubbabel built the second temple in 516 BC. Remember, Solomon's temple was destroyed, so they rebuilt the second temple. And this same temple, the second temple, was enlarged by Herod, in 19th century, um, in the actually 19 BC. So this carried us into the first century. This was the temple that would have been there. The second temple is what would have been there when Jesus was in Jerusalem. Now that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So when the Jews revolted against the Roman Empire, that second temple was, was uh, destroyed in AD 70. So what is standing on the Temple Mount today? When you go to Israel, Gail just got back, what do you see when you go to the Temple Mount? Dome of the Rock. That's in the same place that Solomon's Temple and the Second Temple. Now we have the Dome of the Rock. And uh, so the Dome of the Rock, that is the center that's the central place of worship for the Muslims. And Islam began around A.D. 622, and the Dome of the Rock was built in Jerusalem in 691. That's A.D. So A.D. 691 is when the Dome of the Rock was built. And the Muslims today do not acknowledge that either the first temple or the second temple of Israel existed um, on the Temple Mount, even though there are excavations that prove that. Um, when I was there in 2016, our group went onto the Temple Mount, and our guide was explaining to us the history of the temples, and there a uh, armed person came up and uh, said that we were not allowed to speak of Israel's temple on the Temple Mount, and so our guide said, well, can I say structure? And he said, nope, you cannot make mention of any temple existing before the Dome of the Rock. Uh, but the excavations in biblical history, of course, um, proves otherwise. So it's a, it is a, uh, definitely a, a hot spot uh, today in the Middle East. So at the beginning of the tribulation period, now we're looking beyond the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, they would have been scattered, but there would have been Jews living in the land, but the uh, Muslims begin to dominate. And so, uh, but most of Israel at that time was scattered. And we didn't see a reorganization of the nation of Israel in the homeland until 1948. And so uh, this year is the 70th year anniversary of Israel coming back to the homeland and being established as a nation. So at this time, it was not uh, Israel did not exist as a recognized nation in in the homeland of Israel. And so when they took that back over, they didn't take that part of it. No, they didn't. Uh, and there were, you know, con concessions made at that time, but uh, so that is why it's such a disputed uh, area right now. It's a very holy place, of course, to the Jewish people. But uh, it is contested, and uh, oft, quite often the Jews are not allowed to go on to the, um, onto the Temple Mount. Uh, visitors can, but the Jews themselves, I'm not sure if there's, I think at different times some might be allowed, but then at other times they're not allowed at all. But you see them gathering at the Western Wall. Uh, but that is the, the place, the exact place where we will see 
the third temple, which will be the tribulation temple. Um, three and a half years into the tribulation, uh, we are going to, we will see this uh, temple that is going to be desecrated by the Antichrist as he enthrones himself on the Ark of the Covenant. That's the desecration of the temple. Now, of course, for that temple to be there, for him to desecrate the temple, there a temple has to exist. And so we often hear people talking about the third temple. And that's why, because the Antichrist has to desecrate the temple. Right now, there is no temple there. It's the Dome of the Rock. And so a lot of people are wondering, when will that third temple be built? And there are plans even now in Israel. They have plans. There is a temple institute, and there's a lot of work that is going on uh, to actually rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Very, that's why it's so interesting when you see the United States recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. It begins to make you wonder if we're not getting closer to the time where, where the Jews will be allowed to build their third temple, where they will have access to the Temple Mount once again. Uh, we do know that is going to have to happen before uh, this, at least three and a half years into the tribulation. Could be that Israel, this will be at the time where Israel signs the peace treaty with the Antichrist, and it may be at that time that he rebuilds the third temple. So there's nothing to say that the temple has to re be rebuilt before the rapture. That's another question people ask. Um, but uh, we we have to consider that it's this third temple that John will measure. Yes. Is that in Jerusalem? Yes. These temples are all in Jerusalem. And yes. I got pictures of a bunch of those. Yep. I mean, it looks like the same one. Yes. Yep. The Temple Mount is where God says that He has placed His name forever. Mm -hmm. He has declared that to be um, the place where uh, He has placed His name forever. It is the capital of Israel. It'll be the place from where. Jesus will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so knowing how that, if you go, you'll see that the Eastern gate where Jesus is prophesied that Jesus will return through the Eastern gate. They have, they have bricked that closed because they know that that's the gate. The Messiah is supposed to come and return. So there is, Oh yeah. The Messiah that they don't believe in just in case they've got that sealed shut just in case there's, yeah, they're going to seal that shut, and uh, they take all kinds of precautions because they know that's that's the gate where uh, Jesus uh, is prophesied to come. So it's all, if you go, you'll, you'll get to visit the Temple Mount, um, and you sense the imminency of Jesus' appearing when you go there. Uh, but there's got to be another temple built, and it's the Tribulation Temple, and it's believed that this will be the temple that John uh, John was seeing and then would measure. But that's the question is, what, what temple was he actually um, measuring? Now, it's not clear why. Evelyn says in Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, it says the man of sin is revealed and will sit in the temple of God claiming to be God. And that is the verse that refers to the desecration of this uh, tribulation temple. And so... Um, we're not told why he is uh, told to measure it. We also see Jerusalem being measured in Zechariah 2. And then Ezekiel 40 records the measuring of the millennial temple, uh, which will be for the future kingdom. And we also see the new Jerusalem being measured in Revelation 21. So this, this ceremony of measuring could be symbolic of God's consecration of that that belongs to him. He says, consecrate the temple and consecrate the worshipers. And so all that is measured by God is consecrated to him. And there's something very comforting in that, knowing that God has measured this place. He's declaring it to be his, and not only the place, but those that worship there. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful, it's a rich glimpse at, uh, at, at God's care um, for the temple and its worshipers. Now he is told to leave out the court, which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And that outer court of the temple is the court of the Gentiles. And it's not measured because it's given to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are going to tread Jerusalem underfoot during this final three and a half years 
of the tribulation that leads to the return of Jesus and when he rescues Jerusalem because all of the nations will gang up on Jerusalem preparing to destroy her and that is when Jesus comes to rescue her. Um, so within this setting of the tribulation period, uh, we're introduced to two of God's witnesses and we see them, oh, did I leave, I hope that slide, oh no, here it is. It says, and I will, this is the introduction of God's two witnesses, they're mysterious as well. And it says, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So these are two interesting witnesses that have caused a lot of uh, discussion um, as to who they might be. And we don't know um, who they are. We do know that they prophesy for three and a half years, that they're given supernatural power to defend themselves. I thought that was interesting. It says uh, that fire blows out of their mouth and destroys their enemies, anyone who wants to harm them. So somebody has just the thought of harming them, wants to harm them, boom, they're gone. Fire comes out. Yeah. And, and it says that they have power to control the natural elements and they can strike the earth with plagues. How often? As many times as they want. As many times as they want. And that's a lot of power and a lot of authority. And so these fire breathing witnesses um, are going to strike terror in the people who are gathered around them. And the first question that just begs to be asked, and lots of people have asked is, who are they? And so there's four main views to their identity. And um, first is a symbolic view. And these are, who would be, who would be the ones who would stand with the, hold this symbolic view? The I, idealists. So the idealists say, oh, that's never gonna happen. I mean, that's just obvious. This is not, this is like folklore. Um, they would say that's a symbolic view of the power of God's word, um, that God's word is uh, a consuming fire. And, and so that would be the idealist. Uh, others say that these two witnesses are unknown, that they are just two end time prophets that we have not been introduced to. We don't know them by name, and that's a safe guess. Uh, others have wondered if this might be the reappearance of Elijah and Enoch. Elijah and Enoch. Why would it be Elijah and Enoch? They never, they never died. There we go. So Elijah was taken up and Enoch was walking along with God and then he was taken up. They never experienced death. So people wonder if this will be Elijah and Enoch coming back to experience death. Another uh, view is that it is Elijah and Moses. Why Elijah and Moses? There we go. Yeah, we did have Moses at the scene um, with Jesus when he was glorified. Was Elijah? Yeah, that's, it was Moses. I think it was maybe Elijah. So during the transfiguration, yes, it was. Yes, it was Elijah and Moses. And so we also have Elijah is prophesied in Malachi 4, 5 that he will appear again. It says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. In my mind, I'm usually thinking of that prophecy when I consider Elijah, but he was also present at the Transfiguration along with Moses. And Moses also, if you think about his uh, the mystery surrounding his body uh, after he died, it says in Jude 9, But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said the Lord rebuke you. And so there was mystery surrounding the body of Moses after he died. Um, Moses was present at the transfiguration, Elijah present at the transfiguration, the prophecy that in Malachi that he would return during the time of the Lord. So uh, I would say the if we do know who 
if we've met them before, it might be Elijah and Moses, but it's anyone's guess. Could be two people we've never been introduced to. Yeah. Jewish law, it took two witnesses to establish truth. Right. So Mark has a good point that it's the what it is significant that it is two witnesses because it does take two witnesses to um, establish truth. And so whoever they are, they are fire breathing prophets um, that will appear in this final three and a half years of the tribulation. And so then verses seven to ten say. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the people and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on earth. Um, so when the two witnesses have finished testifying, saying all that God's ordained them to say, this beast comes out of the abyss, which is that place of demons that we saw in the previous chapter. This is where the locust came from, the 200 million horsemen. But this is the first mention of the beast in the book of Revelation, but it will not be the last because this beast in Revelation is none other than the Antichrist. Now we did see perhaps an appearing of the Antichrist with the first seal. If you remember, he came on the white horse. Um, but as far as being called the beast, which is a prophetic name for the Antichrist, this is the first mention of him in Revelation. We had mention of him in Daniel. Daniel 7.23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. So verse 7 says that the beast or the Antichrist is going to kill the two witnesses. Their bodies are going to lay in the street of the great city, which is called Sodom in Egypt, where Jesus, their Lord, was crucified. Jesus, if you remember, was crucified outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And he was cut off from his people. It was just mystically or symbolically called Sodom because of the evil of that place and also Egypt which signifies the place where Israel lived outside of the homeland um, in bondage and under oppression. And this is what Jerusalem is going to become when the Antichrist sets up his throne and desecrates the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And the bodies of these two witnesses are going to remain in this public square for three and a half days. And verse 9 says that these people from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations which is referring to those peoples that John was going to prophesy about. We see him now prophesying about them. Uh, these are the Gentiles who will tread the place underfoot for three and a half years as prophesied by John. And so uh, what was their response to the two bodies? Verses 9 and 10 say, um, oops, that uh, they will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So we see the people still in a state of unrepentance and rebellion. Mm -hmm. Instead of turning to God, they are uh, celebrating the deaths of God's prophets. And as soon as that pressure is relieved, when the prophets die, they go back to partying and celebrating the absence of God. Um, and so it tells you what kind of uh, what's going on on earth. But their celebration is cut short in verses 11 to 13. It says, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. 
So death has no hold over God's servants. And when the breath of life came into them, they stood up and great fear fell on these spectators who had just previously been partying and giving each other gifts to celebrate um, their deaths. And they, these witnesses received a divine invite to come up here and they ascend into heaven in a cloud, which sounds much like how Jesus ascended after his resurrection. Uh, he ascended into the cloud and then there was a great earthquake, just as when Jesus was uh, died on the cross, there was a great earthquake. But in this earthquake, there are 7,000 people that are killed, and the rest are rightly terrified. And they give glory to God in heaven. I don't think this means that they repent. Uh, it's simply that they are now recognizing that the God of heaven is who is empowering those witnesses and also the events that are happening on earth. And so uh, it's a, a scary time, I'm sure, for them. And then in verses 14 to 18, uh, we see just kind of a summary. The second woe is past. Second woe is past. That's which trumpet? The sixth trumpet. So this is this interlude between sixth trumpet and seventh trumpet, which releases the final seven bowls. Second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God the Almighty who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who feared your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And so we have now reached the end of the tribulation. Uh, contained in the seventh trumpet, we'll see the final woe which is the seven bowl judgments. And so we're still going to be in this interlude uh, through chapter 15. We're just discussing the background of these events that we'll see happen very rapidly in chapter 16. Uh, but at the end of this age, God is going to reclaim his rightful reign over the kingdom of earth. And he's going to establish his reign through the reign of Jesus, who is his anointed, who is going to return in power and great glory to tread the wine press of God's wrath over the nations. He's going to rescue Jerusalem from those who have gathered against her. That is the battle of Armageddon. And then Jesus is going to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth. And he will reign in Jerusalem as King of Kings and Lord of Lords for a thousand years. And God's people celebrate um, his victory and they give him thanks who are and who were speaking of God's eternality because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. After the destruction of those who destroy the earth, both great and small, we see the temple of God opening and the Ark of the Covenant appearing in his temple and reminded that God gave that earthly temple to point to a heaven reality, heavenly reality, that God dwells in a temple in heaven, uh, much like the temple that he gave us and modeled on earth. And with that, as, as the end of this tribulation happens, the temple of God is open. The Ark of the Covenant appears in his temple, and there are flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And so Jesus uh, is going to come in power and great glory. His kingdom will be forever and ever. God is going to reveal his glory, and God is to be revered as we approach um, that time. Next week, we're going to study Revelation 12 which is the most symbolic chapter in the entire Bible. It's still part of the interlude, and it's gonna, there's going to be in chapters 12 and 13 seven major tribulation personages that are going to be introduced. They're going to be introduced symbolically, so we've got to work through that symbolism. Um, but as for this chapter and chapter 11, quick summary, the holy city will be measured, and God's two witnesses will testify for three and a half years during the final half of the tribulation. And the truth we learn about God is that the holy city will be measured and God's two witnesses will testify for three and a half years during the final half of the tribulation. And so as you consider this terrifying time, uh, 
we uh, want to remember that God is a mighty king whose reign will endure forever and ever. And we have that hope to look forward to. There, the end of the story has already been made known, and God wins. Uh, but he is simply going to allow this to play out as he administers his judgment during this final age. And so how is your reverence of God reflected in your reverence of his prophecies? And how is your reverence of God reflected in your worship and thanksgiving to him, as we saw reflected um, in this prelude of praise, uh, even in this interlude? Any questions about this final chapter 11? I'm still perplexed. If one day all the Christians disappeared in thin air. <laughs> how could anybody not believe? Yeah, Mark says, how is it that when all the Christians disappear, um, if the rapture takes place, how is it that they don't simply believe? Mm -hmm. And I would think that they would just come up with, just as they have throughout their mm -hmm. lives, come up with other ideas of what might have happened. Oh, right, that. right. There's a big, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about aliens. So, yeah, perhaps the aliens have taken them, or perhaps they're the ones that are punished, that they disappeared because they were being punished, and the ones that are remaining, you know, maybe they'll think they're the ones who have survived. Well, if you think about it, when they, they still, after going through all of these, play, or all of these woes and judgments and everything else, they're still not repenting. Right. And so, yeah. to see all that and still... And there's a reason, you know, when people refuse to turn to God, it's not because they can't understand him. It's because they don't want him. When they saw those two witnesses die, they celebrated the absence of God. And so uh, it's not that they don't understand. It's not that it hasn't been made to, known to them. They simply reject him. And God is not punishing innocent people here. He is punishing people who have invited um, this judgment. And so... Uh, we're reminded of that as we see how many times they're given chances to repent through those witnesses, and still the witnesses die and they celebrated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Caroline, so Caroline says to live by deception. Exactly. And Jean says aliens, ha ha ha. Yes, but. <laughs> this may be a little bit of an elementary question, but uh, one thing I'm having a little bit of trouble with mm -hmm. we've already gone through the rapture. When yes. All this is happening, right? We're hoping. No, we're hoping. <laughs> yes, we are hoping. We are hoping before these events, because this is that seven year period, we are hoping for a pre trib rapture, which means that the church will be removed before the seven year period starts. Okay, so we're hoping yes. that we won't see any of this. Exactly. We're hoping that we won't be here. And so don't become worried that the church. You know, it's not speaking of the church when it's speaking of this Gentiles. These are these are the people in this final age who have gathered against Jerusalem. That is what is being staged. Yeah, yeah. That is what's being staged at the Battle of Armageddon. And that's where we will end. When Jesus comes, it will be at the Battle of Armageddon. So that's who he's referring to. Well, let's close up with a word of prayer. And uh, John... Uh, says, please explain about the dead shall be judged. And uh, the dead in this sense is the spiritually dead. And uh, because the, the dead who have died separated from Jesus will not be resurrected till the end of the millennium, and they will stand before the great white throne judgment. So in this passage, when it's speaking of the dead shall be judged, the dead in the sense that they are spiritually dead. They are cut off from God and they have no, no life because, they, um, because they're dead in sin. And so they, that is who the judgment is coming upon. Yeah. Let's close up with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We do praise you for you are a God who so loved the world that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, this gospel is too profound for us to fully comprehend how gracious you are, that you have just through belief in your son who did all the work, who paid the price for our sin, who died in our place, whose blood was shed, and it is by his blood that we have been redeemed. 
And Father, we come to you during this age with great thanks, Father, and glory to you for the gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the gospel and its power, for it is your power for salvation to everyone who believes. And we pray, Father, during this age that we will be faithful stewards of your word that we will proclaim the gospel knowing that apart from Jesus, people will enter into judgment, whether it is eternal judgment or into this tribulation. Father, there will be judgment for those who are dead in sin. And I pray as we study this period that the fact that judgment follows um, for those who refuse to repent, I pray, Father, that the light and the love and truth of Jesus will shine very brightly in and through us, impacting the world around us. Uh, Father, that many hearts will be turned to you in hope and that they might take their place amongst those who have been sanctified by faith in Jesus. May we be faithful stewards. I mean, you send us out as ambassadors. And wherever we go, may we carry the fragrance of Christ with us. And it will always be to the praise of your glory. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.